This is our fifth video lecture on Lesson 5 from Clayton Croy's A Primer to Biblical Greek. In this lecture, we will discuss the definite article and adjectives of the first and second declension. Let's start again with a brief review. Remember that Greek nouns have gender, number, and case. That there are patterns or declensions for forming Greek nouns that indicate gender, number, and case. And so why we review that is that the formation of the definite article and adjectives follow these basic patterns with slight modifications. So remember that we discussed specific endings for nouns. So for singular, we talked about um, the, the masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. Remember that masculine and neuter were second declension nouns and feminine were uh, first declension nouns. And so here is a chart providing the basic endings to all three forms of those nouns. So we could read it across, starting with the nominative, os, a, on, u, ace, u, o, a, o, on, ain, on, e, a, and on. You should see that these are the basic endings of the, of the nouns that we've already discussed in previous lectures. And so we can do the same thing then with plural nouns. Again, we have the five cases and uh, in, the, in the rows and then the three different genders for those three different types of nouns in the columns. And again, it's oi, i, a, on, 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 ois, ais, ois, us, as, a, oi, i, a. For most forms, the definite article is simply going to be the addition of the letter tau to those endings. So let's see what that means. Again, let's start with forms of the singular definite article. Here, the exceptions to that general rule of adding a tau to the endings of nouns uh, reflect the exceptions. And so you'll see that uh, for the singular, the nominative singulars are all slightly different than what we would expect and then the neuter accusative is also different. But other than that, those endings from the nouns are perfectly matched up, uh, just joined to the tau. So ha, he, ta, tu, te, tu, to, te, to, ton, ten, ta. And then again, let's look at the plural. Once again, the green are the exceptions to the general rule. Here there are only two, and that's the masculine nominative and the feminine non nominative. Other than that, the endings look exactly like they did with the endings of nouns. So, hoi, hi, ta, ton, 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 tois, tais, tois, tus, tas, ta. All right, now that we have the form of the definite article in mind, let's discuss more about the function of the definite article. So just to review again, remind, remember that a definite article is just the, let the word the in English. The definite article identifies limits or defines, but in, in addition to being used sort of as we would understand it in English as the, it may be also used with proper nouns like ha Jesus, but we wouldn't translate that as the Jesus. We would simply translate it as Jesus. Similarly, there are some abstract nouns such as agape, which is the Greek word for love, that we wouldn't probably translate the definite articles if they were present. So even if we saw hey agape, we might translate that simply as love rather than as the love. Thirdly, um, as you might have seen in the forms that we just reviewed, there is no vocative form of the definite article. And finally, uh, just a brief note about translating definite articles. If you are ever in doubt about whether or not to translate the or not to translate it, to have it present or not to have it present, feel free to use parentheses because that's showing me that you recognize that there is a definite article in the Greek, but you're not, you're not confident of translating it into regular English that would make sense to an English speaker. So the definite article um, is, is a segue then into the forms of the adjective, which are very similar. And so you'll see here um, in this chart, the endings again are in red and they are very similar to the endings of those different nouns and of the definite article that we've seen previously. This is just the Greek word for good or beautiful. So kalas, kale, kalon, kalu, kales, kalu, kalo, kale, kalo, kalon, kalen, kalon, kale, kale, kalon. Here is the 
the plural form of the adjective for good or beautiful. Uh, again, it goes kaloi, kalai, kala, kalon, 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 kalois, kalais, kalois, kalus, kalas, kala, kaloi, kalai, kala. Again, my expectation is not that you could reproduce these charts, but that you would begin to recognize these endings in context and be able to analyze the, the nouns and the um, other words in a sentence and then make a translation. So let's talk more fully about the adjective. Here are just some brief notes on the adjective. First, just to define it, adjectives are words that describe or modify nouns. So in the picture there to the right, it's not just that uh, this character is wearing a suit, but that the character is wearing a yellow suit. So yellow is an adjective that specifies the type of suit. It modifies that noun, suit. Uh, adjectives will agree with the noun that they modify in gender, number, and case. There are basically three types of, of adjectives that we want to discuss, and, and we're going to do our best to maintain these differences because they result in very different meanings in Greek. The first is an attributive adjective, and these essentially attribute um, an identity or a description of something to a noun. So the yellow suit uh, was an example of an attributive adjective. The next is a predicate adjective, which is simply it renames or it asserts something about a noun. And here we would insert an is in between the noun and the adjective in most translations. And finally, a substantive is when the adjective actually takes the substance of a noun. So it sort of stands in for a noun. A standard example of this in English is the poor, um, where poor is an adjective, but here it's functioning as a noun, the poor ones or the poor people. And so in Greek, um, the way that we're going to differentiate between these three different types of adjectives is the presence or non-presence of definite articles. All right, so let's discuss these three different types of adjectives a little bit more carefully. So let's begin with attributive adjectives. And remember, these are adjectives that attribute or describe something. So in English, we would say the good deed. So we're, we're, the adjective is specifying what kind of deed it is. It's good. It's not bad. It's not ugly. It's not long. It's not short. It's good. So that's the adjective. So in Greek, we would, we would, we would see this in two ways. We might see the adjective kalon there between a noun and its article. So ta kalon ergon. So we see that uh, the ergon is in the um, nominative case. We know that by the definite article ta. Um, and then uh, kalon agrees with it in uh, number, gender, and case. So um, we see that sort of agreement. Or uh, the adjective good could follow the noun and then have an article of its own. So ta ergon, ta kalon. So again, let me emphasize the importance of the article. All right, so then let's talk about predicate adjectives. Remember, these are, these are adjectives that sort of rename the noun. And so in English, this would be, a, the example would be the deed is good. It's not just specifying uh, which deed or what kind of deed. It's sort of renaming the deed. The deed is good, and we see that with the translation is. So in Greek, we would see this in one of two ways. We, we might see it before or after the noun and its article. And so um, whether or not it occurs before or after, it does not have its own article. So kalon ta ergon would be good is the deed. Um, or the good, the deed is good would be a fine translation. Or ta ergon kalon. Again, the the deed is good, and we see that kalon in neither case has its own article, um, and it either precedes that phrase, the article and its noun, or follows that phrase. It's important to be paying attention to the location of the adjective and how that adjective relates to the noun and its definite article. All right, finally, substantive articles. These are, again, articles that take the substance of a noun. They sort of stand in for the noun. So in English, we would say the faithful. Faithful is an adjective that could be modifying something, but here it's simply standing in for a noun. And so in Greek, the way that we would see this is an adjective and an article without a noun. So both number and gender of adjectives are important. Um, in terms of how we translate. And so an example of that is hoi pistoi um, is masculine plural, right? 
and we would translate that as either the faithful ones or the faithful men. Uh, Greek is a little tricky in that masculine plural can include um, genders that are not masculine, so it might be men and women. But when we see something like hi pistai, um, this is only the faithful women. The feminine plural tells us that we're talking about women. All right, so a brief notes about some additional verbs or some nuances of verbs that you need to know about. First, uh, you need to know that verbs may take a case other than the accusative case to complete the meaning. Remember we said that often the accusative case indicated the direct object. There are some that take a different case. So, for example, the, the verb akuo, which means I hear, it takes either the genitive or the accusative. And so um, a sentence like akuo tes phonase means I hear the voice. The voice is here the object of my hearing. Um, but it's not in the accusative case, maybe as we would expect, it's in the genitive case. And then another example would be pistuo, which takes the dative case for its, for its object. And so uh, pistuo means I trust or believe. And so if you saw the sentence pistuo to theo, um, it would be something like I trust God. Let's uh, do one of the first exercises in the practice and review section from Croy. Dikaios kai Hagias, ha kurias to uranu. So, uh, as we've done with our previous exercises, the first thing we want to do is find the main verb. And here we encounter our first problem. There is nothing in this sentence that has an ending like any of the now or any of the verbs that we've learned in the past. And so we need to conclude that there isn't a main verb. And so um, it, the next thing that we would look for is the nominative. And here we are clued off by that definite article before kurias. So ha kurias, these are both in the nominative case, and this signals to us this is the noun. This is the nominative um, or the subject of the sentence. And now we're going to look for some adjectives, and we see that we have a number of adjectives. We have two, dikaios and hagias. And incidentally, both of these are also in the masculine nominative singular, and so they agree in number gender, and case with the nominative hakurias. So somehow these adjectives are related to the noun. And so um, we see that that hagias is in front of hakurias. So is the kaios. They're both in front of that phrase hakurias. And so this tells us that uh, we are in the predicate position. Remember that um, that, that the predicate adjective always either, the adjective either follows the phrase or it precedes it. And in this case, those two adjectives are preceding that phrase, hakurias. And so once we've sort of identified those adjectives and thought about their function, um, then we would determine the function of other words. And so the other words that we're looking at are tu uranu. And we see the endings u um, on both endings, indicating that we are in, we have a masculine singular genitive noun. In this case, um, we're, we're going to be translating it sort of as a limiting, um, as we've seen in previous exercises, uh, telling us which Lord. Well, it's the Lord of heaven. Um, so we would translate it of heaven there. So a full translation then um, would be the Lord of heaven is righteous and holy. All right. So that's the end of this lesson on lesson five um, on the definite article and adjectives. Now, I, I do encourage you to um, go back to the part of the lecture where we discuss the three different functions of the adjectives. Typically, this is a place where students get held up. And so I would really review those rules, review the rules in CROI, um, so that before you start translating the practice in review, you have a really good sense of the different functions of the adjectives and how you would know which, which type of adjective you're working with. Thank you for your attention.